let's now move to the preliminary results of our 2015 census tests. We'll start with Jessica and Mike and Frank providing an overview of the optimizing self-response test in the Savannah, Georgia area. And then we'll move to Marianne and to Tom to hear about the preliminary findings from the 2015 census test in Maricopa County, Arizona. I would like to stress before we get too far into these presentations, these are preliminary results. Um, they will be more uh, anecdotal findings than quantitative findings. As I mentioned earlier, our next push will be analyzing the data that come in from these tests and we'll have more details to share with you uh, during the October PMR. So keep that in mind as you hear the presentations. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jessica. Good morning, I'm Jessica Graber and I'm here with Michael Bentley and Frank McPhillips. And today we'll give an update on the 2015 optimizing self-response test, including some preliminary results. As I mentioned in the last PMR, our objective for the 2015 OSR test was to increase self-response through the research and testing of contact and communication strategies. And this was being done prior to awarding a communications contract. This test was designed to build and expand upon what we learned in the 2014 census test. So to refresh your memory about the 2014 census test, at that time we tested a pre-registration option called Notify Me, and that's where respondents could sign up to receive notification when the internet instrument was available. We also tested the substitution of an email invitation for the initial mailed letter, as well as um, offered the option to respond without a census ID. And all non-ID cases in 2014 were processed in batch mode. The 2015 census, 2015 OSR test took place in Savannah, Georgia, Savannah, Georgia media market. And in comparison, it included partnership and outreach activities, a contact approach designed, I'm sorry, contact approach designed to promote internet self-response, an early announcement offer, notify me, but this time paired with advertising, and the option to self-respond without a unique census ID. And in 2015, it, these cases were processed in real time. The 2015 optimizing self-response test included our most successful contact approach from 2014. This is ca called the internet push strategy. And it's a series of contacts beginning with a mailed letter of invitation, followed by two reminder postcards, and finally, the mailing of a hard copy questionnaire. Next, I'll present our mail panel design and highlight two important design changes that Deirdre spoke, about, spoke of earlier. These changes allowed us to fully optimize what we can learn from this test. This slide shows our initial mail panel design with three panels, each made up of 30,000 housing units. The first was our pre-registration or notify me panel where we mailed a postcard invitation inviting them to participate in this notify me option. While we didn't see high levels of response to the notify me option in 2014, we wanted to evaluate this in the context of outreach and partnership efforts. All non-responding housing units who did not take advantage of this option received our standard internet push mailings. The second panel, labeled non-ID, also received the internet push contacts, but they were not provided a census ID with which to respond. We had a similar panel in 2014, but as I noted earlier, in 2015 we used real-time non-ID processing instead of the batch processing. And the third panel is considered our control panel and received the identical number and schedule of mailings, but were in fact assigned a census ID. So this next slide describes the first design change you that we made. While our initial ma mail panel design included 90,000 housing units, the entire Savannah media market of approximately 400,000 households was in fact eligible to participate, with those not sampled eligible to use the non-ID option. We anticipated that we'd identify any response from the remaining households uh, that they would have been the result of our outreach and promotion efforts. So early on in the data collection period, we realized we had an opportunity to test an additional panel in our design, one that took advantage of this test environment, of, out, of this outreach environment, and would help us understand the impact of providing just a single mailing, but providing something tangible that would remind people and prompt their response. 
So we selected a new postcard panel of 30,000 housing units that included only units not previously sampled. Each of these 30,000 housing units received a single postcard with a message letting them know that it's not too late to respond. While not explicitly stated, the mailing assumed they would have been exposed to the ongoing promotion and outreach in the area. None of these cases in this new panel were provided a census ID. The second design change, also noted this morning, was the addition of a re-interview component. And the objective of the re-interview is to validate responses that we've collected over the internet. Cases selected for validation include those who responded both with and without a census ID. And our plan is to re-interview a total of 5,000 cases, either in person or by phone. Here you can see a timeline of test operations. We've completed primary data collection in Savannah, and re-interview activities are scheduled to begin on July 15th. And now I'll pass this to Mike and to Frank, who will provide some preliminary findings from the test. And then Deirdre will speak later on today about how these results inform our plans for the 2016 test. Thanks, Jessica. Hi, everyone. I'm pleased to present some prelimi prelimi preliminary findings on the response rates from the test in Savannah. We are still processing late mail responses for another few days or so, and the post-processing is still being finalized, but nearly half of the sample in the three initial mail-out panels has responded. The total number is highest in the control panel where we provided an ID. Weighted to reflect the sample design, 47.9% response is of June 29th, with 33.6% of the sample responding by internet. Those rates are statistically higher than both in the panel without an ID and with the Notify Me postcard panel, which have response of about 44 and 47% respectively. You may recall, as Jessica mentioned, that we also tested Notify Me and non-ID responses as part of the 2014 census test last year in parts of DC and Montgomery County. But we wanted to also study these in an environment with advertising and promotions. The results we saw in 2015 in Savannah are consistent with what we learned last year. Not providing an ID to the address will lead to a lower response rate overall, primarily because some of the non-ID cases won't be matched to our address frame. Similarly, we learned that the added burden of the Notify Me postcard, in which they are asked to register for the preference and then to come back and respond, may have inhibited overall response for that panel. I'll talk a little bit more about the Notify Me results in just a few moments. As Jessica previously mentioned, during the test, as we began to assess progress early on, we decided to include an additional postcard mail-out, which was sent to a sample of addresses outside of the three initial mail-out panels to um, households who had not yet responded to advertising or promotional efforts. This postcard resulted in about 8% of the 30,000 sample responding without an ID, mostly by internet, with the remainder providing a response by phone. Further, the promotion and outreach efforts were very successful in bringing in more than 35,000 respondents from outside the mail panels in Savannah to respond. Recall that these respondents did not receive any mail materials at all, but instead were motivated to respond to be counted based solely on an ad they saw or heard, word of mouth, or perhaps by attending one of various partnership events throughout one of the 20 counties in Savannah. Slide nine, please. Finally, the last preliminary self-response result we want to discuss today is the Notify Me census of encouraging people to pre-register to receive an email or text invitation as their co contact method. During the sign-up period, a total of 1,925 participants pre-registered. Of these, 1,341 signed up before the cutoff date and were matched. And of those, 1,203 were in one of the 20 counties comprising the Savannah area. The majority, over 80% of these, selected email as their preferred contact method, with the others opting to receive a text message. About 93% of these participants ultimately came back and responded, most by internet. Overall, these results are very similar to what we learned in last year's 2014 census test, where participation with pre-registration was also fairly low. 
Together, the results of the Notify Me testing both last year and in 2015 will inform our, up, our upcoming 2020 design decision later this year. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Frank for an early look at some of the interesting results on the non-ID processing in the test. Thanks, Mike. Good morning, everyone. Um, for today, uh, given the brief time we had, I just wanted to cover a, a couple of things um, in our uh, early results uh, analysis. Um, so we're going to look at um, when we got the non-ID responses um, to kind of give you an idea of, of uh, sort of the distribution of, of workload, because I know that was of interest going into the test in terms of the system performance and so forth. And then also I'm going to show you a little bit about um, what happened during real time um, matching and geocoding of the non-ID responses and then the influence of the use of administrative records data following that real-time processing. And uh, at the tail end, I'll just tell you a little bit about other stuff that we're uh, tabulating. So, hmm. Mike, slide, got it. Um, so slide 11 uh, talks a little bit about the distribution of uh, the response over the course of the test. So this is basically uh, last week of March through uh, end of May. Um, and as you can see, the bulk of the response was up front around when we were doing most of the promotional efforts and uh, there were mailings going on and so forth. Um, that would then give us another bump. Um, essentially, though, um, you know, things went comparable to the way that we would have expected. And um, you see some small spikes at the, at the tail end of the test, again, when we did uh, additional mailings and tried to promote response. Um, so this was... Um, covered uh, in some of the other material. Um, and we did see in terms of uh, days of the week, uh, definitely weekends saw a lower response. Um, and Monday through Wednesday was, was uh, typically the, the greatest amount of response. And um, uh, actually later in the test, that shifted a little bit to Wednesday, Thursday. So the next slide break, excuse me, breaks it down by day of the week. And obviously, uh, Wednesday had the largest percentage uh, at almost 20%. Um, and then again, Saturday and Sunday, the smallest. Um, and then uh, you can see the progression very comparable for uh, Monday, Tuesday, and then Thursday catches up a little bit. Um, before I talked about the uh, results of real time versus um, administrative matching, I just wanted to review a little bit about the process. Um, so real time matching occurs, and, and geocoding, I should say, occurs uh, during the self response. So the respondent enters their address, you know, um, next screen they see the standardized version of their address so we can confirm this, this is a good address to process. Then the next step is um, before they continue the interview, we hit the matching and geocoding service and we get that result. Um, and so after that though, for cases that do not match, we turn those all over to um, our uh, Center for Administrative Records and Research Applications uh, area who use a process to um, apply a composite of commercial and federal uh, administrative records data to try to pick up missing data elements or uh, correct misspellings, things like that, to see if we can get another shot at matching. And so um, that's just a reminder of, of what's in that composite and, and what we used uh, before we go to the actual results. So um, this shows, at a high level, the matching results and what we're showing here is, is um, uh, in the first row, matched and geocoded is really representative of um, uh, a geocode, uh, a match to a record that has a, a, a census block assigned already and um, where we were very strict about the rules um, in, in which uh, we permitted the, the, the record to, to be considered resolved, if you will, and we could consider um, that case as a response and therefore remove it from non-response follow-up. And so for this test only, we just um, used very strict rules that allowed us to, to identify operations from the 2010 census, which would have physically verified the, the existence and location of the address. Um, and then the next row shows actually um, a, a more broad category where we also got matches um, and either the, the record and the master address file was ungeocoded or it was another kind of geocode. And this is uh, what I was alluding to in terms of the strictness of the rules. So in this category, um, we didn't, again, just for this test, consider some of the more recent updates that we've gotten to the MAF. Um, and what that allows us to do is, is look within that category 
um, and, and kind of reevaluate those rules and see, um, you know, what areas where we might want to um, reconsider, you know, accepting that geocode that goes with that MAF record. The bottom line is that you can see that we had an extremely high match rate uh, actually during real time, um, you know, just under 97 percent. And so uh, if you include both rows, and then when you add in what the uh, administrative records composite does for us, um, that rate gets up to like 98.5 percent. So very encouraging matching results, um, and this is, of course, inclusive of both uh, the cases that Michael was talking about in terms of um, the sampled non-ID cases that were in panel as well as the, the rest of the site, those that responded without um, us getting or sending them any direct mailings. So this next slide just breaks it down a little bit further um, in terms of those matching results. Um, and uh, I just want to qualify that unacceptable geocode in, in the second row, that was just our terminology. As it didn't meet our rules for this test. Um, and so that's the category we can really look at um, in terms of refining those rules, looking at those sources of, of the MAF uh, input and the, the geocodes that were associated with it, and then see if, um, you know, what, what part of the rule we want to revisit. And we already have a good idea of that from our preliminary analysis. Um, and then um, the matched but ungeocoded is really another opportunity. Um, this was typically cases from the delivery sequence file, I should say, addresses that we received from the delivery sequence file that perhaps we just don't have a, a tiger feature yet or an address range for that tiger feature. So we haven't assigned the geocode yet, um, you know, using our, our typical methodologies. But uh, certainly the work that's going on through the uh, geographic support system uh, work and the um, typical work we do to maintain the MAF and Tiger during the, the decade will uh, put us in a better position in 2020 to have a lot of those DSF records already geocoded so that when we make the match, um, it's, we can call the case done. So bottom line though, you're really seeing um, an extremely high match rate and again, very encouraging. So just a quick look ahead for what you'll be able to expect to hear about in uh, the next PMR or, or at least in the, the uh, analysis report that will come out from our team is we're also going to be looking at the demographics of non-ID respondents. Um, you know, what are the characteristics of the folks that, that decided not to use their ID? Um, and in particular those that were not in our sample group, but uh, um, I'm particularly interested in the ones that just opted um, to, to go that route. And that might help us in terms of planning and, and uh, you know, targeting, um, you know, uh, certain groups for uh, this kind of response and, and seeing if there are those that just have that propensity. Um, we're also looking at um, comparing uh, results from the other site tests. So this is Maricopa County. Um, and we did self-response that included a non-ID component. We did not do real-time processing there, but we used the same business processes to do the matching and geocoding, so we have a basis for comparison between the sites. Um, and, you know, just a little uh, foreshadowing, uh, one of the things we saw was that the real-time processing seemed to really help us boost those match rates. Uh, we could see that difference between the two sites. So um, looking forward to uh, letting you know a little bit more about that the next time we talk. Um, and then finally, uh, we're going to be looking at um, uh, the workload that in a traditional um, non-ID processing uh, operation in, for a decennial that we would have processed in a manual uh, fashion. So this is things that we couldn't resolve during uh, automated processing. So we'll be able to give you a sense of, uh, of those cases that fell out of automated processing. You know, for example, we weren't able to obtain a geocode or we could neither match our geocode, how many of those we could have subsequently resolved. So um, looking forward to uh, getting to uh, finish digging through the data and, uh, and getting all the good results out of that. Questions for the team? Hi, just real quick, simple in the weeds. Uh, since it's such a large group, could you just give one example of what you mean by a geocode that's unacceptable? I mean, what, what are we talking about there? Sure. So um, we were very conservative in, in the rules for this um, test. And um, again, uh, some of the, the things that we would have accepted uh, as far as a source for a geocode for a MAF record in this case would have been a, a 2010 operation where we had, uh, you know, such as address canvassing where somebody physically, um, you know, observes this address on the ground. 
Now, in the category that, that you're asking about, a big group is um, the uh, records that have come in from our partners through the geographic support system efforts. Um, certainly, you know, we can uh, know those to be uh, good quality addresses, and we have, you know, subsequent work that's happened and, and the GEO has been doing for the last few years as well um, to, to validate those inputs from local sources. So we, that category is going to move into the acceptable geocode. You know, that's uh, probably the most classic example. Okay, um, before we move on to the preliminary findings from the 2015 census test, I just want to take a brief opportunity to make this real and sum it up a little bit as we move into the design decisions associated with the operational plan. So as you heard from the team, uh, findings from both the 2014 and the 2015 test showed us that asking people to pre-register or sign up for Notify Me hasn't really been successful. Um, you heard that people don't really mind entering in that 14-digit ID that we send to them. However, with that said, because non-ID processing has been so successful and we're receiving such a good match rate, it is a very good mechanism for helping to make the census more mobile as we move forward, giving people an opportunity to respond anytime, anywhere. So with that, I'd like to move to the results from the 15 test, uh, and Marianne will kick that off. Okay, good morning. As Georgia said, my name is Marianne Chapin. This morning, Tom Muley and I are very happy to be here with you to present some of our preliminary findings from the 2015 census test. The 2015 census test was really a tremendous experience for us, and overall, we, we deem it a huge success. We've learned a great deal from our experiences that will inform the design decisions we'll make later this year. It will shape the enhancements that we plan for the 2016 census tests other future tests, and the 2020 census itself. The 2015 census test was not intended to be the full or final solution that we use for the 2020 census. So we fully acknowledge that some aspects of what we implemented in Maricopa County were more mature than other aspects. So over the next, oh, I'm sorry. Over the next 45 minutes, Tom and I will share with you information on our administrative records processing, and we'll present a representation of the more prevalent qualitative findings reported by participants and or observers of the test. What is presented is not going to be an exhaustive list. Additional observations, the analysis that will be conducted on the data that was collected, and the remaining activities for this test will continue to inform our understanding of what happened during the test. In the presentation, we'll touch on topics related to the United States Postal Service support of this test, our approach to training, the compass application that was used for data collection, some procedural situations that we encountered, and field reengineering. We'll close with an update on the bring your own device testing, the evaluation follow-up, and talk some about our next steps. Before getting into the specifics of the test, the next couple of slides are provided to give you sort of a refresher about some of the specifics of the 2015 census test. Our focus for the 2015 census test was on testing innovations and collecting data that will inform the preliminary design decisions that we'll make later this year. In the 2015 census test, we tested the re-engineering of roles, responsibilities, and infrastructure for conducting field data collection. We tested the feasibility of fully utilizing the advantage, advantages of planned automation and available real-time data to transform the efficiency and effectiveness of our data collection operations. We further explored the use of data that households have already provided to the government to reduce the non-response follow-up workload and increase the overall non-response follow-up productivity through the use of administrative records, field reengineering, and adaptive design. We also tested the operational implementation of a bring-your-own-device option for our enumerators. And we will conduct focus groups to explore the reactions of, of the uh, respondents from the census test on contact methods, 
administrative record usage, privacy and confidentiality concerns, and how we as the Census Bureau may be able to address those concerns. As stated earlier, the 2015 census test was conducted in Maricopa County, Arizona. Block groups for the test were identified based on their diversity of socioeconomic characteristics. The block groups in central Maricopa that are shown in blue were selected for their high concentrations of both vacant and Hispanic populations. The block groups located in the cities of Chandler and Mesa, shown in yellow and pink respectively, were identified as areas with higher 2010 census return rates and lower mobility. The block groups in the outer ring on the northern border of Maricopa County that are shown in green were selected to allow us to test in more remote locations. Seen on this slide are some of the key milestones for the 2015 census test. The items shown in black with a check mark are those activities that were completed as of our last PMR in April. Those shown in blue with a check mark are the activities that we have completed since that PMR, and those that are shown in blue with an open circle are the items that are still to be completed. At this point, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Tom Muley. Tom will share with you some information on our administrative records identification and processing. Thank you, Marianne. Today I'm gonna to be able to share some of the results that we had from the administrative records identification that we did uh, while production was happening for the 2015 census test. I'll go over the data sources that we used and I will go over the results that we had from the identification. The phase one that we identified on May 12th, this was two days before the start of the non-response follow-up op operation. And then also document we were able to identify and we are phase two. This was something based on the, how the data was coming in from the Internal Revenue Service. This was something that we were able to add on as the test was going on, an additional identification of administrative records while the test was going on. So we would document both of those phases and then also share some of the characteristics of these identified units that we had. So going first with the administrative records, which files did we end up using in our identification? So the first part, the first top of this, the federal sources that we did end up using. We started by using the Internal Revenue Service individual income tax returns. And we owe a big thank you to the IRS because they were able for the processing for this test to be able to start delivering the 1040 individual tax returns. They were able to start delivering that to us on a monthly basis starting in March. So for our processing, especially for our phase one delivery, we had their deliveries from March, April, and the delivery that they were able to do the beginning of May. So we had that 1040 information for people who started filing in February available for our use in this test. We also utilized the Internal Revenue Service, the information returns, your 1099 information about interest and dividends. That was another source that we were able to use uh, to be able to develop our rosters and use our information of determining uh, our, for our predictive models. We also continued to use the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the Medicare Enrollment Database. This is another major source that we've used in the past, which gives us coverage of the elderly population and also sources that not uh, picked up from the two uh, Internal Revenue Service sources that I just mentioned earlier. For this test, a new source that we did end up using was the Indian Health Service, this patient database. Since we were conducting this test in Maricopa County, which had some concentration of Indian populations, this was another source that we ended up using in, when building our rosters. We also utilized the Social Security number identification file, or the Numident. This was used as part of CARA as their processing, of their being able to assign the protective identification keys to the rector. And plus also this was allowed for the persons, it was a major source of age and sex information for those people. So those are some examples that we use for persons and being able to build rosters for administrative record households. We also continue to use the United States Postal Service. For the 2015 census test, we did conduct four mailings. With those mailings, we were requested from the United States Postal Service if they could uh, unable to deliver as addressed. They provided that information and also those reasons. So we were able to use that information from the second mailing, which had a in-home delivery date targeted for April 1st as part of our information as well. 
We also, as part of this test, we did use a commercial third-party file. We used the Target's federal consumer file. One thing with this is we did not use this file to build rosters. We did not take persons from this file and put them into the households that we were building. But we did use this as another point of, piece of information. For persons that we had rostered from the federal sources that I listed earlier, we used the Targus as another source to say, was that person associated with our sample address or was that person associated with another address? And we also used, with partnering with the uh, Fitness for Use team, uh, we were able to use best race and best historic, uh, Hispanic origin assignment that Sonia Rostogi and her team was able to do. They were able to use 2010 census and other federal, state, and commercial sources to be able to assign for the administrative records what their best race and Hispanic origin information was. Now this was information that was based on 2010 processing. So one thing Sonia did want me to point out is that additional work and in taking into account additional census responses or also additional federal or state or uh, commercial responses could have additional improvements in the future. So let's go over some of the administrative records identification results. So two days before the start of the non-response follow-up operation, we conducted our first phase one of our administrative records processing. We identified all of the cases that were eligible for the non-response follow-up operation that hadn't received a response yet. We proceeded to implement our our, our production approach, which this, for this test, we ended up using predictive models as compared to the rule-based approaches that we did in the past. Applying our predictive model methodologies, we were able to identify for the records that we had, 11.6% of those we identified as being administrative record vacant. Then we proceeded to also identify for 18.1%, we proceeded to identify that they were administrative record occupied based on the roster of people that we were able to put together for those housing units. So that did result that it was 70.2%, which at this point in time, we did not make a determination. For these cases, they, went, they proceeded to go out to the field for the enumerations, especially for the two experimental panels where the administrative records information was utilized. I mean, main things in terms of this is either we did not have administrative records, either person or from the United States Postal Service, either undeliverable as addressed information to make a decision, or we had information, but they were below our cutoffs. So I did mention that we did implement a phase two of this in the early June. One of the things that we were able to see with working with the Center for Economic Statistics and also with uh, CARA is that when an Internal Revenue Service was delivering these monthly files is we had a very quick turnaround in being able to have these files available to us. And IRS was delivering these files to us in a very timely manner. So in early June, we got the next delivery of the Internal Revenue Service 1040 tax returns. So based on that, we implemented an additional processing of identifying administrative records. So at this point, we took the cases before that we could not determine, we took the new information that we had, and we proceeded to run our predictive model approaches. And so the result of that is out of that 70.2% that we had before, there was another 1.7% that we were able to identify as administrative records occupied. We were able to process this information, have this available on June 5th. So when June 6th came around, it came time to start doing the field work for our full removal panel, experimental panel. These cases were removed from the field work on June 6th. They got no more visits. For our hybrid removal, which those cases were getting one visit, if those cases had already been visited, they were turned off. And then we provided the information that for these cases, any point after that, once they got those visits, the work for those can stop. So one of the things we're trying to do as part of doing these research is what things have we learned in previous tests and previous, uh, how are we carrying those forwards? So this slide here is I'm showing results that we showed back in January. What was one of the things that we were seeing in January related to the performance of administrative records, especially when we were identifying occupied units? So one of the things that we ended up seeing in the 2014 test is when we were looking at the results of how the count comparison, how the count that we had based on our administrative records household, how did that compare to the census determination based on field work, we ended up seeing that there was three household composition categories that performed better than others. So we were able to classify cases based on their administrative record composition 
based on the number of adults that were there, based on 18 or more, and whether kids 17 and under were present or not. We ended up seeing in the 2014 test that the one adult, no children, two adults with no children, or two adults with children, those three categories were performing better in the 2014 test. They had count agreements between 57 and 65%. When we were seeing those and we were implementing predictive modeling approaches for the 2015, we were researching ways we might be able to account for this and have this in our predictive models. So one of the things I want to show from our 2015 results is we ran our 2015 processing with our predictive models. We were able to identify the administrative records occupied cases, this 18.1% that I described in phase one and the 1.7 that I described in phase two. So what, how, did those go, how were those distributed across these adult and child, these household composition categories? And one of the things we were able to see as part of our predictive approaches that we're using for the 2015 test is that the cases that we are identifying were primarily coming from the three categories that performed the best in the 2014 test. So with the one adult, zero children, they had, uh, for focusing on phase one, 34% of the cases we identified were fell into that category, 30.1% fall in the two adult, no children category, and 25.2% fell in the two adult with one plus category. So we were able to see with our approaches that we are identifying cases that were in categories that performed better in the 2014 test. One thing that which we did not uh, go into detail in the January 2014 PMR when we were discussing 2014 results is what were we seeing related to race and Hispanic origin. So how often was race and Hispanic origin information available from the administrative record sources? So as part of the 2015 census test, there was a combined question of race and Hispanic origin in the same question. So I'm gonna present some results based on a combined race and Hispanic origin categories. So show results based on eight categories, based on Hispanic, and then there'll be six categories of non-Hispanic, which each one of the races alone, and then non-Hispanic or two or more races. So we're gonna be able to look and be able to say for these administrative records cases that we have identified, looking at our past census sources and the, the work that the fitness for use team was able to provide based on best race and best Hispanic origin, how often do we have race and Hispanic origin available to us? So in the 2015 census test, we were able to see that we, for overall for phase one, we had a race, or Hispanic, race and Hispanic origin available 82% of the time and for the phase two cases we identified, it was 77% of the time. Uh, also, this uh, figure shows results for the four areas that uh, Marianne highlighted earlier. These were the four different areas of the test. Uh, so we were able to see the central area, which in addition to the characteristics that Mary Ann mentioned, also had a very heavily Hispanic population. We generally would see similar performing results across all of the four different areas. Chandler does have a 72% for phase two, but that only had 1.7% of cases identified overall, so there's definitely a small sample size there. So the other thing which we did want to look at was being able to see for these four different areas, breaking down those where we had his race and Hispanic origin available, how much did we have for the eight categories which I described earlier? So some of the things that we were able to see is that in the central Maricopa area, 55.3% of the time, we had a Hispanic response from our best race and Hispanic origin results. We were generally able to see for the three other areas that the non-Hispanic white alone, that those results were between 51 and 66%. We were also able to see that in the Mesa area, uh, that the American Indian and Alaska Native, the non-Hispanic alone group, there was a 3.6%. We generally saw for the non-Hispanic black alone that the results range between 2.1 and 8.3%. And then for the Asian alone, we did see in the Chandler area, there was a 5.2%. So those are some of the results that we saw related to the race and Hispanic origin. So one thing that we're going to do is our further analysis is gonna be definitely digging deeper. We are, we are working with CARA to have the 2015 census uh, responses have the protective identification keys assigned to those. So with our control panel, where we did do identification, but those cases did go out to the field, we were able to compare on an individual record uh, basis the uh, race and Hispanic origin information that we have versus what was collected in the field. So that's definitely future work that's gonna be done related to this. And they also showed some results related to the count comparisons earlier, and we can continue to do those again for the 
2015 test, but one thing this test does have, it does have an evaluation follow-up component where additional interviewing and results will be available for those comparisons as well. Uh, at this point, I will turn it back to Mary Ann. Thanks, Tom. I'd now like to focus the balance of our presentation on our operational experiences with the 2015 census test. In past PMRs, we've talked about our target sample sizes for the test. On this slide, um, we'd like to share with you some information about the cases that were included in the non-response follow-up field data collection workload. Before speaking to the details of this table, although not a main objective for this test, we did achieve a self-response rate of approximately 56% in Maricopa County. So now as a reminder, there were three panels in the 2015 census test, a control panel and two experimental panels. The two experimental panels being the full removal panel and the hybrid removal panel. The control panel employed similar procedures to those used in the 2010 census. The full removal panel implemented an adaptive design contact strategy and reduced the initial non-response follow-up workload by excluding any addresses identified as vacant or occupied based on administrative records prior to any contact attempts being made in the field. Remaining non-response follow-up cases were visited at least once. In the hybrid removal panel, the initial non-response follow-up workload was reduced to exclude any addresses identified as vacant using administrative records prior to any contact attempts being made. For all remaining addresses, enumerators made one personal visit. After that initial attempt, for those cases that were not resolved, the non-response follow-up workload was further reduced to remove any of the addresses that could be enumerated using administrative records. The cases that remained after the additional administrative records removal had at least one additional contact attempt made. So now looking at the table, I'd like to draw your attention to the column labeled final workload. It's the second from the right on the top part of the table. The numbers in this column reflect the non-response follow-up workload or the field data collection workload for each panel. The workloads factor in the initial self-response workload for each panel subsampling that was done to arrive at our target sample sizes. It reflects the administrative records removal of vacants from the hybrid panel, the administrative records removal of the vacant and occupied from the full removal panel, and the removal of late self-responses prior to the first day of our field work. The lower portion of the table represents how the cases included in the non-response follow-up workload were resolved. I'd like to draw your attention to the line labeled discontinued with administrative records. The discontinued with administrative records reflects the number of cases removed from the non-response follow-up workload in the hybrid panel for those cases unresolved after that first attempt and for which we had administrative records that could be used for enumeration. Finally, I'd like to point out the row labeled late returns after the NERFU start. These cases reflect um, or could reflect what really were genuine and legitimate late self-responses, or they may be self-responses that were generated as a result of the notice of visits that we left on the door at each attempt that directed the respondents for the experimental cases to either the internet, to questionnaire assistance, or to return their paper form. I also want to note for the one case shown for the control panel that was not resolved. We did determine that this case could not be closed out because the information that we had for this case did not meet the compass requirements that an address had to include either a house number and street name or a location description. For this case, we only had a street name, PO box number, and map spot. So this situation is going to factor into the lessons learned from this 2015 census test and how we move forward for 2016. For the 2015 census test, the Census Bureau partnered with the United States Postal Service to assist in the steps necessary for our job applicants to complete their enrollment steps, which included fingerprinting, 
swearing of the oath of office, and having a photo identification taken. 12 United States Postal Service locations across Maricopa County were identified to support the 2015 census test. Early in the test, we did experience some challenges in the scheduling of the appointments for our field staff to complete their application process. To work with the Census Bureau, the USPS staff were required to attain a special sworn status. We experienced some delays in some of these offices in having their clerks sworn. Um, this resulted in not having our clerks, the clerks trained on the necessary procedures and equipment that would allow them to complete the um, application process for our enumerators. So on April 3rd, which is when we expected to have all 12 of the locations functional, we had 10 of the 12 fully functional. Also, in an effort to be proactive, the Census Bureau began steps to select our field staff earlier than we had originally communicated to the Postal Service. So while they were expecting only a very few number of staff to be scheduling appointments during that first week, we overwhelmed the Postal Service offices by having approximately 300 people trying to schedule appointments. In addition, we experienced some challenges with the actual scheduler itself. Applicants were having difficulty getting through to the United States Postal Service. Uh, this was a concern since our applicants have only 10 days to visit the USPS for their fingerprinting and their paperwork or their offer of employment could be rescinded. <coughs> to rectify the situation, the Decennial Service Center was able to receive calls from the applicants schedule the appointments, and send to the United States Postal Service offices a secure file that contained the information they needed on the appointments. Then the USPS could confirm the appointments with the applicants, and this alleviated the challenges that we had with getting the appointments scheduled. We also experienced a gap in service on April 15th or tax day, where we had limited sites and appointments available. This was not something that we, the Census Bureau, had expected and really was primarily just a communication breakdown and something that we should have anticipated. In addition, we did experience some other minor situations that really could be expected the first time you try to test something like this. But all of these experiences are going to better position us for the future endeavors when we partner with the United States Postal Service. I do also want to mention that the Postal Service played an essential role in a couple other aspects of the 2015 census test. First, as Tom mentioned earlier, they provided the detailed reasons why mail was undeliverable as addressed, which was integral in our ability to identify and remove vacants from the non-response follow-up workload. But then in addition, we were able to take advantage of a service that's offered by the United States Postal Service that assisted in our early recruiting efforts in areas where we were having a challenge getting the um, desired number of applicants. We were able to take advantage of the every door direct mailing that allowed us to have a postcard generated and delivered to target areas that um, communicated to the people in those areas about the census test and the job opportunities available. Over the next several slides, our focus will be on the experimental panels and the enhancements and innovations used for those panels. We've learned much more than we're going to be able to share in a few slides, but the next few slides will attempt to hit some of the key points but is not intended to be a comprehensive listing of our successes, our challenges, or the opportunities that the 2015 census test did afford us. First, we'll discuss our new approach to training for the experimental panel enumerators. As a quick reminder, the 2010 census and for the control panel, the training used a, was a verbatim approach. For the experimental panels, the training used a blended methodology that incorporated best practices of adult education. It involved nine hours of online pre-classroom enumer independent study, seven hours of in-classroom training, and then an additional two hours of post-classroom online training. Overall, with this training approach, we were able to reduce the number of training hours as compared to the 2010 census 
from 32 hours to 18 hours. This training approach was successful in providing standardization of the information and experiences for all the enumerators. It provided for tracking that enumerators had completed their online training and offered various learning methods. A key success for the 2015 census test was that after completion of the online training and the classroom training, we did identify several topics where the enumerators required some additional information to, um, to clarify various aspects of their job. Very quickly, the rocket team was able to develop training videos that provided the needed information. A link to the video was texted out to the enumerators, allowing them access to the information delivered in a timely, efficient, and consistent manner. Another aspect of the 2015 census test was the employment of a concept of a training specialist. This training specialist was responsible for training the experimental panel enumerators who were to perform the field data collection. These positions for this test were filled by existing Census Bureau employees, relied on their knowledge and experience, and some minimal training specific to the test. We heard from some enumerators who participated in the training that they felt the training specialists were not knowledgeable on the subject matter, the compass application, or the experimental panel procedures, and were not necessarily invested in the success of the test. Our long-term vision really is to establish a position where the primary responsibility for where the primary responsibility is the training of our enumerators, and that the people that fill these positions will be subject to a rigorous train the trainer program. So for the 2016 test, we'll take another step toward that ultimate vision with establishing the training specialist position and putting those training specialists through a robust training program. From our enumerator debriefings, we did hear that in general, the online and classroom training was well received but we did hear about some specific areas where we need to consider change, and these included um, including more practice on handling difficult cases, and specifically on the harder to refusal type situations, clearer instructions on who to call for assistance, and more instruction on how to text and set up their voicemails. We'll now move on to the Compass application. As a reminder, the data collection for the 2015 census test used the Compass application on an Android device. <coughs> In general, enumerators found that the, enumerate, the Android devices and the Compass application were easy to use. However, enumerators and observers reported crashing or freezing of the Compass application. When this occurred, the smartphone screen would go blank or the screen would freeze, causing the enumerator to have to reopen the case before being able to proceed with the interview. The crashing or freezing of the application was attributed to several causes, including excessive heat of the device and memory demands while we had maps open in the background. Further research is needed on these situations in terms of the crashing, crashing and freezing but it is subject to the reports that were called into our decennial service center when the enumerators experienced that. And we do think that that was severely under uh, reported to the decennial service center. Um, in addition, enumerators were concerned and or frustrated when cases that they believe they had resolved were not disappearing from their case list. It seems that the root cause of this may have been a training issue meaning that enumerators may not have been trained well enough on what happens when a case becomes proxy eligible and that it remains on their active case list. So after completing an attempt and coding it appropriately, if that case then becomes proxy eligible because it's exhausted all of the attempts available, the case will remain on the active case list for 90 minutes. And this was to allow the enumerators time to locate um, someone who could provide an acceptable proxy response. If the, union, if the unit was also proxy eligible and was also a multi-unit, the case would remain on their active case list until 11 o'clock at night. This allowed the enumerators to work any additional units within that multi-unit structure and to have time to go to the management office 
and obtain information um, specific to the proxy responses for those cases. Finally, observers also reported respondent frustration with our coverage questions. As an enumerator approaches the completion of the interview, he or she must ask a series of overcount questions to ensure that we are not including anyone in the household um, enumeration that may have or should have been counted elsewhere. It was reported that these questions created some frustration and undue burden on the respondents, and modifications to these questions are in the works for the 2016 census test. And as a last comment, over the course of the test, we were able to release several new versions of the Compass application that addressed various situations encountered by the enumerators. The new releases fix things like um, fixes to reduce the impact on the map usage that I mentioned earlier that was contributing to the crashes and freezes. We were very pleased with how these software releases occurred. This wasn't something we were able to test in the 2014 census test. And so we see the deployment of these releases as a significant accomplishment for the 2015 test. We'll now cover um, various components of the 2015 census test um, specific to some procedures and the interaction of the Compass application and the management of assignments. In the test, enumerators encountered situations such as proxy interviews, vacant housing units, addresses that did not exist, and other types of non-interviews. And the Compass application did have the functionality needed to handle the outcomes of these non-standard situations. However, we learned that the procedural and operational implication, implementation requires improved alignment of the functionality that exists within the Compass application. Learning from our 2015 census test experiences, discussions are needed on the various non-standard scenarios to more fully understand and define the expected enumerator experience such improvements to the compass functionality and the pathing through the application can enable the enumerator to more successfully perform their job. Similarly, greater coordination of the assignment of non-response follow-up cases within multi-unit structures is needed. Observers reported multiple enumerators visiting the same multi-unit complexes on a given day or from one day to the next. This resulted in leasing managers being contacted by multiple enumerators requesting similar information on the occupancy status of units. Additional thought and planning is needed with regard to how to handle assignments within multi-unit structures. An approach to the multi-unit structures may also have applicability as we think about how to handle assignments within gated communities. We'll now cover various components of the 2015 census test specific to the re-engineering of the management of the field work. The Area Operations Support Center, or AOSC, was observed to be very well run and much quieter than a, local, a typical local census office. Very noticeable was the lack of paper due to automation of data collection and the electronic payroll. The Area Manager of Operations, or AMO, and the Field Manager of Operations, or FMOs, were well equipped to perform the functions that we asked of them. It should be noted, however, that the AMO and one of the two FMOs were experienced Census Bureau staff and were able to master the requirements of their job without problem. The second of the two FMOs was hired off the street and experienced a steeper learning curve that's more likely to be reflective of what we will see as we staff up for the 2020 census. The alerts that were generated by the Operational Control System, or MOJO, were very successful in identifying situations that required, in, in some instances, us to um, contact our enumerators and take some corrective action. Another very successful aspect of the test was the entry of enumerator work availability. 
we found that when the enumerators indicated that they were available for work and that when work was available and assigned to an enumerator, they did in fact work the hours that they had indicated. This even includes the Memorial Day holiday that was in the midst of this test. The workload optimization that considered an enumerator's home location, the location of the non-response follow-up workload, and the use of a response propensity model to predict when respondents are more likely to be home was observed to be very effective. In fact, when we had observers from headquarters out in the field, um, we did have someone from our National Processing Center there and they want, were interested in how they might be able to use this in informing when to call respondents that, for the cases that go to the call centers. And then finally, overall, while we consider the routing of cases in the 2015 census test a success, there were observations um, reported that the order in which enumerators were instructed to work their cases at times was inefficient. Observers reported instances where enumerators would have to backtrack, returning to addresses that they had passed on their way to another address. To address the situation during the test, we were able to make some slight improvements that address some of the inefficiencies. Since that test, we've had much more detailed discussions between the staff that are designing the operational control system and the routing algorithm in a, with additions from our geography staff to identify how we can improve the routing algorithm that we'll use for the 2016 census test. Our efforts to test the, test the technical implementation of Bring Your Own Device have concluded. The enumerators who participated in the Bring Your Own Device testing were recruited from the enumerators who conducted the non-response follow-up um, control panel data collection and who had a mobile device that met established operating system requirements for iOS or Android platforms. Selected enumerators used their own device for this data collection to contact addresses. We had the potential to contact up to 4,500 addresses in the test. Ultimately, over the 12-day period uh, for the data collection, we completed work on approximately 2,300 cases. Approximately 80 enumerators participated in the Bring Your Own Device testing. Prior to conducting the data collection, the enumerators participated in one of six half-day sessions where they validated that their devices did in fact meet the minimum operating system requirements. They downloaded and installed the CAP Compass application. They reviewed and signed the acceptable use policy and reviewed and, assi and signed the reimbursement policy that was specific to this test. Some initial observations associated with the BYO testing include that the training was fairly labor intensive, validating the minimum operating system requirements and ensuring that the Compass application was downloaded and installed correctly required a heavy involvement from census headquarters staff that were present to assist enumerators. Based on that, thought is being given to the development of uh, pre-training device preparation instructions and perhaps conducting separate training sessions based on the device operating system, whether, whether it was iOS or Android. From July 20th through August 14th, enumerators who are specially trained on re-interviewing techniques will conduct the evaluation follow-up operation. There are two major objectives to the evaluation follow-up, those being to obtain the most accurate status of the housing unit on census day and to identify people associated with the occupied housing unit during the calendar year, as well as the timing of their association with that housing unit. This will ultimately help determine the most accurate household status and roster for census day. The evaluation follow-up will consist of approximately 4,100 cases subsampled from the non-response follow-up control panel cases where housing unit information collected in the non-response follow-up differs or conflicts with information we have from administrative records for that housing unit. Training for the evaluation follow-up enumerators will occur next week and will begin the data collection um, conducting it from mid-July through mid-August. 
With so much accomplished, we still have so much more to do. Next week, we'll conduct the focus groups aimed at the specific aspects of the respondent experience. We will still have to complete the data collection for the evaluation follow-up. And with the majority of the field data collection complete, staff are now turning their attention to data analysis and understanding what that data tell us about the approaches to administrative records for the identification of vacant addresses and occupied units, as well as what the data tell us about the re-engineered field management structure, automated training, adaptive design, optimized assignment management, and route optimization. The results of the analysis will inform the preliminary design decisions that we'll make in the upcoming months. And finally, the results from the field observations, the debriefings, our lessons learned, and our data analysis will inform our planning for the 2016 census test and beyond. And with that, Tom and I will be happy to take your questions. Thanks, Marianne. And yes, the 2015 test was really, I enjoyed going out in the field and seeing rocket and compass. Um, very, very interesting, very different. Uh, I wanted to go back to the table, and I apologize if you already addressed this um, on page 11, no, 15, I'm sorry, 15, yeah, on page 15, uh, the row that says discontinued without ADREC, mm -hmm. uh, did you discuss like those numbers which seem rather large? I didn't discuss those, but those oh. are primarily for the cases where they exhausted their maximum attempts and were then the work stopped in the field after they'd had the opportunity to conduct a proxy interview. <clears throat> So, and so, but they were not completed. Right, they didn't end right. with a respondent provided response. Okay, so you'll be analyzing more about that? Then. Yes, yeah, yes, thanks. Thanks again for all this information. Uh, a couple of quick observations and then um, I think a question related to them. When, uh, you've got a lot of lessons learned and feedback, right? And I mean, I'm just listening to what you said. Some sound like they're going to directly inform the design. Some may directly inform some tools. Others are going to inform future tests, how you do the tests. And, and some, it sounds like, might be informing how you might be trying to interpret the data from the tests as well. Uh, the other observation is I, I know you have a governance framework for recommendation follow-up. Um, we've heard about previously. And I guess the question is, uh, how much of what you've talked about and learned, I know we've had lots of conversations, you've heard from lots of other observers as well, how much of that is being captured kind of formally by your, your governance framework for ensuring that these many, 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 many different lessons um, get tracked and followed through on? First, we have the uh, responses from our focus groups and our debriefings. Formal uh, results of those activities are taking place. Next, any person who went out into the field to conduct an observation um, on behalf of headquarters or the regional offices was asked to submit a trip report. Those uh, trip reports are, were tabulating and, and tallying the lessons learned from those reports. Um, everything that we heard from the managers that were working out of the AOSC, the uh, FMOs, the LSOs, and then the enumerators in the field were documenting as well. And as you'll hear when I give the 2016 census test update, we're applying what we've learned to our planning for the future. I guess, is, is there, could you say more about like tracking? I mean, I guess there were a couple things, for mm -hmm. example, like on the multi-units that, you know, you struggle with in 14, but, you know, still struggling with them in 15. Uh -huh. And and uh, just, uh, could you say more about how you're ensuring that 
I mean, some of these things you can't allocate resources to deal with, and you won't just prudent reasons for not doing so, but, but just kind of the control mechanism sure. in place over making sure things aren't falling through the cracks. Mm -hmm. I should have mentioned that we um, just last year developed a formal knowledge management database, and that is one way. And then another way, Anne talked about the decision analysis that we're doing as part of the development of the operational plan. That is another way where we're bringing all the key leaders for each operation into the room. Uh, and documenting the key questions and the answers uh, moving forward. Uh, <clears throat> Marianne, regarding the Mojo alerts, you classified those as very successful during the 2015 test. Can you talk a little bit more about how you um, came to that conclusion? I think primarily, so we had several types of alerts that were thrown. There were things like the long distance flag, which um, gave an indication of whether enumerators were exceeding an acceptable or established um, distance from where we expected them to be conducting the interview. We had short interview flags, which we looked for enumerators who may have had um, cases being conducted very quickly. Um, we also looked at, um, or there was an alert associated with if an enumerator had, I'm going to say, um, the number of sufficient partials they had was out of line from what their peers were, ex were experiencing. So having these alerts thrown, um, we were able to, when they occurred, take some immediate actions to contact the enumerators and talk to them about what was going on. And um, sometimes there are legitimate explanations for what they were seeing, but it allowed us to monitor this in real time. And um, that was very successful in terms of reaching the enumerators and talking through what we were seeing and ensuring that um, we weren't seeing something egregious occurring in the field. Okay, I think you just explained how they were supposed to work, but have you done any work to analyze whether or not they did work when they were supposed to work? Um, I think some of that analysis is going on now. Dan. Just a couple of clarifying questions. Uh, on the bring your own device panel, I uh, just wanted to clear up in my own mind. You could use either an iOS or an Android device, but what was the minimum specification? Were you any idea how it broke down between iOS and Android, or were they required to have uh, a, a tablet class as opposed to um, working on the smaller iPhone size? So let me see if I've got your question. Are you asking me, do I know the breakdown between the iOS and Android in terms of the participants? I don't have those numbers readily available with me. And did we allow for the a minimum tablet? standard for? Right. I don't know the those off the top bring. of my head. I believe they went back. I'm trying to see if I can see a face in the audience that might be able to give me that information. Uh, may have been like a couple iterations older than maybe the most current operating system available. But okay. again, I would need to confirm that. Brian may know. He looks like he's going to. So, Dan, I don't have the specifics, but we did not require the latest, greatest device. There was several iterations of, you know, N minus four, I think, comes to mind for me of what was available. So it was a pretty wide uh, inventory of commercially available devices. Okay. And then the second one uh, on the evaluation follow-up um, component of this, which we'll be starting up. Um, What's the introductory script? What do you tell the people that you're going back to who have been contacted at NERFU a while back of why the people are back knocking on the door again? And then is the exact content of the interview after that the same? Um, or is there any variation of the coverage probe questions in particular that you uh, go through in the evaluation follow-up interview as opposed to the um, initial? Yeah, I, I don't know the, the introductory script, so we can look into that and provide it to you. But one thing can clarify, we do ask some more additional questions relating to their residents that were not asked as part of the coverage follow-up questions, so we do do that. Since we are interested in the, whether the unit was vacant on census day or not, we do have some additional questions related to vacancy 
that were not asked. And one of our follow-up groups is where we had an administrative records response but the non-response follow-up res response was provided by a proxy respondent. So those instances were trying to go back to a household member and try to get the interview with the householder. So that's, an, that's at least one group of cases where we're not going back a repetitive time. But yeah, you do bring up good points. We try to think of those since we are going out again for another visit. We try to take those into account with, while dividing, designing the survey. How many people had an opportunity to go out and observe in Maricopa County in the heat? Many people in this room. And how many people have a much finer appreciation for what those people in the field have to do to get those interviews done? <laughs> yeah. Thank you to the team. Uh, I'm going to try to keep us on schedule with a presentation about our upcoming 2016 census testing activities. And Chuck, I'm going to move right into slide two. We have two significant tests planned for fiscal year 2016. Uh, first, the 2016 census test, and second, the address canvassing test. Our 2016 census test, um, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to begin moving from small scale individual tests that we've conducted over the past few years, where we were looking at proof of concepts and prototypes to much more refined tests as we move forward and the building of the systems that are going to help us support the 2020 census. This test, again, will have uh, an April 1st census day to mirror what will occur in 2020. We've selected two urban areas for this uh, test. First, uh, within, we're going to conduct the test within contiguous areas within Los Angeles County, California, and Harris County, Texas, specifically in Houston. Um, I was really pleased to see those two maps outside the door that are blown up showing the test areas. So if you haven't taken a look, please do so on your way out. Um, why were these two sites selected? Well, we had a, a lot of objectives that we wanted to meet. Um, these two urban locations afforded us the opportunity to test our objectives. Uh, Los Angeles is the second largest city in the United States with a population of 3.8 million, according to our ACS data. And Houston is the fourth largest city with a population of 2.1 million people. These areas contain large degrees of language diversity. During the 2015 census test, we had to descope our work related to the language program. But we really need to ramp that up during our next few tests. Both of these areas contain language diverse populations with strong concentrations of people who are limited English proficient. Um, in Los Angeles, 16.3% of the population is limited English proficient, and in Houston, it's 13.59%. Um, these areas have strong degrees of demographic diversity, good mix of Hispanic, Asian, white, and black populations for us to do our testing. Uh, in Houston, we have an extremely high vacancy rate of 12.3% as compared to the national average of 7%. Um, Los Angeles is very close to the national average at 6.8%. But the high vacancy rate is good for us uh, in terms of testing the use of administrative records and removing those vacant housing units from the non-response follow-up workload. Um, as we've studied in other tests, we are uh, extremely interested in knowing the degree of internet usage within the area. Uh, in Los Angeles and Houston, we have about 79% of the population that has access to high speed internet. This data too came from the ACS. Um, okay, for the next slide, Chuck. Mm -hmm. Um, you'll recall that during our 2015 census tests, we focused on self-response during the optimizing self-response test in Savannah. We focused on non-response in our test in Maricopa County. This 2016 census test is going to bring those components together. Our self-responsive objectives will include providing support for respondents with limited English proficiency. And how do we plan to do that? Both in terms of the way we contact people, so via the invitation letters and the postcards will do that in multiple languages. And also we'll do that via the response options that we provide. So on the internet, on paper, during non-response follow-up, we'll offer the option to respond in different languages. 
Uh, right now we're planning to support the English, Spanish, Chinese, and Korean languages. Um, in addition, we're going to use partnerships to reach the demographic demographically diverse populations. We know from the 2010 census and from uh, our preliminary work in Savannah that these partnerships are critical to reaching those harder to count populations. Uh, I'm happy to report that for the first time we're going to use text messaging uh, to reach out and help motivate self-response. We're going to continue to refine our non-ID processing methodology. We've seen very promising results thus far and we want to continue to see what we can do in that regard. And finally, we'll test uh, the use of a cloud-based infrastructure for the first time for both our self-response and our non-ID processing options. Um, the 2016 test will be the one that allows us to operationalize our new methods and new technology across multiple locations and time zones uh, during the non-response follow-up operations. Our objectives to non-response follow-up include determining our strategy for the 2020 census. How are we going to use administrative records to reduce the non-response follow-up universe and to determine the number of contacts that we're going to make with each non-responding household? We'll continue to refine our field management structure. What is the appropriate ratio of enumerators to local supervisors of operations and lo local supervisors of operations to our field managers? Uh, I think it's pretty well known that in the 2010 census we had a ratio of eight enumerators to one crew leader. Uh, during the 15 test we had a ratio of about 16 enumerators to one local superv supervisor of operation. We're going to see what is the best ratio. Um, what else? We're going to enhance the sophisticated operational control system that's used to manage our caseload, and we're going to make refinements to our Compass application, the application that we use to collect the interviews on the handheld device. Um, Ty alluded to the problems that we experienced in multi-unit structures. Um, we talked about this the other day. Uh, many of us think of multi-unit structures, especially those of us who kind of grew up in the New York regional office as those high-rise buildings. Um, but in Phoenix, in, especially in the Mesa area, we saw um, many gated communities. And so when we send our enumerators there, what is the best way to do that? Should we send one enumerator? Should we send two? we've learned that we should definitely not send too many. It's not good um, in terms of making relationships with the, the community management, and it's not good in terms of um, ensuring uh, stability within the census uh, framework. Um, during this test, we're also going to really study uh, quality control to help identify pulse, uh, possible falsification that could be occurring or um, errors that perhaps enumerators are making, uh, we'd like to do that in real time and fix the problem sooner rather than later. Uh, more specifically, we'll use data that's collected during the interview. First, global positioning system points, GPS points, uh, to help us determine where the enumerator actually is during the interview. And second, uh, the time of the interview and the length of the interview. All of those things can help us determine problems that may be occurring in the field. We have not had a re-interview functionality built into our application um, in conjunction with the actual interviewing capability. We'll do that for the 2016 test. And finally, we'll test the use of administrative records to help us with in-house quality control as part of this test. Um, now let's turn to the address canvassing test. Evan and Mike and Pat. Um, talked about the research that we did as part of the address validation test, and all of that is helping inform this address canvassing test that's planned for the fall of 2016. I think it's important to mention that this test will span both fiscal years 16 and 17. We'll start in September of 16 and then move into October. Our objectives here include implement, implement, implementing our new methodologies for both in-office and in-field canvassing. How do these two operations work together? Um, we'll use the listing and mapping instrument, one of our enterprise systems for collecting addresses when we're in the field. We'll test the use of a new geography uh, to collect our data, the use of a basic collection unit 
as opposed to our traditional census geography. Finally, we'll use the data that we collect during this test to update our Math Tiger system. Um, in terms of the location, this test will be conducted nationwide. Um, we'll do in-field address canvassing across the nation. We'll also do in-office canvassing across the nation. With that said, we're interested in building the foundation for our 2017 test. So we're going to focus on specific areas to help us do that. Build a good frame in these areas, use those same areas when we go out in the field in 2017 for that test. So we'd like to focus on an urban area, ideally one that's been a participant in our geographic support system initiative to see how data that they've been providing over the decade informs uh, the building of the address list at this point. We'd like to again include representation of our limited English proficient populations, and we'd like to consider um, the degree of connectivity in terms of internet connection that we have there. Um, we will focus on two Indian reservations to help us uh, with the question of tribal enrollment, and we'll also focus on Puerto Rico in this test. Finally, as we refine our operations and we move from research and testing to implementation, we're beginning to do the same with our systems. As I mentioned earlier, we're now moving from our proof of concept, our prototype systems. We're adding functionality as we go along and we're building the systems that will be used for 2020. This slide does a good job of making the connection between our operation and the system we'll use. Uh, just to give you a few examples of the enterprise systems that we're using, to help us with address listing, we'll use the listing and mapping instrument. To help us with internet respo response, we'll use a um, Primus. Many of you have heard that we've been working with Centurion. We're considering the use of a new application to help with internet response. Um, we'll use ICADE, our integrated capture and data entry system, to help with paper response. We'll use a multi-mode operational control system to help with non-response follow-up. And then we're using some systems that were developed specifically for 2020, our non-ID processing systems, as Frank talked about earlier, and then Compass to help with conducting the interviews. So that, in a nutshell, is an overview of what we have planned for 2016. Uh, on June 30th, a press release went out. We have our uh, internet site updated with frequently asked questions about the two tests. And then again, we have the maps outside the door, so please take a look. Any questions about 16? Brad. <clears throat> I didn't hear you mention training for the 2016 census test. Mm -hmm. Does that mean you're going to replicate the, the training approach you used in 2015? Mm -hmm. We will continue with the use of automated training. We do have lessons learned, um, and we are going to apply those to the training uh, development and okay. the actual implementation of the training. Okay, that was my next question. You're going to use the knowledge checks and the focus groups from DYOD and the debriefing session? Definitely. Okay. Yep. Other questions? Sharon. I'm, I'm just curious because you're now ramping up, so you're going to be needing greater funding in 16 and 17 mm -hmm. than you've been using or existing in the past. Uh -huh. uh, how are those years funding looking to you mm -hmm. with the past back information that you have as well as what Commerce is debating about giving you for 17? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I'll start by saying over the past few years, we've done a very good job of sharing what we've done very well. Um, with limited funding, people have worked very hard focusing on our key innovation areas, the areas that we talked about today, re-engineering address canvassing, optimizing self-response, using administrative records and re-engineering field operations. I think you'll attest that our progress over the past few years has been very good, and it's really due to the people that are sitting in this room. People have been working very hard, they're very committed to the job, and they've ensured success for these census tests. Um, with that said, we've put things to the side. Um, we haven't focused on some of the operations that are very important to the census. Um, it's time now that we need to focus on those operations. I talked about how we de-scope the language program in 15. We have to get back to that in 16. We have not worked on group quarters operations, those populations that are related to the military, that live in nursing homes, uh, college dormitories. We have to focus on that now. 
we really have to begin working on our legally mandated program, so the redistricting data program, the local update of census addresses, we have to make those happen in FY16. Otherwise, we're going to fall behind. And as I mentioned, it's critical that we begin to really move from our proof of concept, our prototype systems, to the actual systems that we'll use for 2020. Um, many people say, uh, you know, what is your vision? What do you think? I have to be ready for a 2018 end-to-end -end test. That is almost my census, right? We have to be good to go. We have to be able to know the systems we use in 2018 are those that we're going to use in 2020. We only have time to make minor adjustments to those systems to be prepared. Um, with that said, um, we could potentially take significant cuts to our budget. Um, we are right now working with our budget shop in-house. We're working with the department, uh, with the Office of Management and Budget on the impacts, on the risks, um, and I'll leave it at that. Dan. Just one quick thing, um, when you said, maybe a grammar question more than anything else, but uh, when you say refinement of real-time non-ID processing methods, including respondent validation, does real-time apply to respondent validation? Is that trying to implement that person check in line when they're trying to reply, or is respondent validation still being conceived of, or um, at least for the 16 test, as being a post hoc check. I'm going to give you the 10,000 foot answer and then I'm going to look to Evan to provide more details. So yes, we are looking at how to validate respondents in real time as they're responding to the census. And now I'll turn it over. <laughs> so from a real time respondent validation perspective, <clears throat> we have put a request for information out on the street and we've done um, an analysis of the results of that RFI. I think in general the recommendation is that respondent validation be a combination of real-time and post-process. In addition to that, we have begun an engagement with a group um, that will provide us with some recommendations on the most efficient and effective way to do this on October 1st. So at that point, we will take all of those recommendations and make some decisions about the methodologies that we will employ in the 2016 census test to do this in the most efficient and effective way possible. Okay, we're right on schedule, so I'm gonna keep us moving. Um, I'd just now like to wrap up we, what we heard today. Uh, to summarize what the panel has shared with you. First, I think it's very important to stress that we are on track to deliver our initial 2020 census operational plan, the baseline by the end of this fiscal year. Anne uh, mentioned that in the past, we didn't do this this early in the decade. So in relation to the 2010 census, we did not release our operational plan until 2008. In relation to the 2000 census, we released the plan in 2000. So we are well ahead of the game, and I'm really pleased about that. In answer to Ty's question, I mentioned that we will not only be sharing the narrative, what we're calling our working papers, as we um, announce our operational plan, but we will have a slide deck library to make it a little bit easier to get through the meat, uh, the substance of the documentation. In terms of the address validation test, um, we learned that our models were not as accurate in predicting areas of change as we thought they may be, that we really need to turn and look more closely at those in-office methods, such, such as the review of imagery, uh, the use of commercial and administrative data sources, and that in certain areas, in-field address canvassing is still necessary. Uh, you heard that we will conduct uh, another test of partial block canvassing as part of our 2016 address canvassing test. We learned from the optimizing self-response test in Savannah that the internet continues to be a very effective mode of response. Uh, our internet push strategy where we invite people to respond to the internet before doing anything else is working. We've seen a higher response from those people that we shared a census ID with. Very interesting finding, I think. 
uh, notify me is not showing really prom real promise. And finally, we are um, very effective in doing real-time matching for those non-ID cases coming in. In relation to the 2015 census test, we've learned that administrative records are proving very effective in helping us identify those vacant housing units and in reducing the non-response follow-up follow workload, as well as uh, identifying race and Hispanic origin data. I'd like to stress here, and Tom mentioned this, we have a very strong relationship at this point with the Internal Revenue Service and with the United States Postal Service, and we're very appreciative for that and for their help. Automated training is proving really effective, as is using technology to manage the caseload. Um, we know that everything wasn't perfect. We did have, as Ty mentioned, a lot of lessons learned, a lot of findings. You saw that when you were out in the field. But the work that we've done has shown great progress. We know we have a lot more to do, but we're at a very good point. Uh, finally, in terms of the 2016 tests, we have these two, two tests gearing up now. Not only are we going to analyze what we learned in 15, we're going to apply it and we're going to plan and implement 16. Um, with that, I'd just like to say one more thing. We're really interested in knowing what you think about this new format. So do you like the setup in the auditorium versus the conference center? Please let me know after the meeting or at a later time. Um, the conference room afforded us with a little bit more intimate or conversational setting. This seemed a little bit more formal, but it also felt a lot cooler, a lot more. Um, we had a little bit more space to work with. So let me know about that. And also, what do you think about the half day meeting as opposed to the full day? Um, somehow, I always seem to get the first presentation of the last presentation of the day. Mm -hmm. And the past two PMRs at 3 o'clock when I looked out at the audience, everybody looked like they'd had enough. And I think the panel felt like they had enough. But today, people seem to look happy and fresh. Uh, so let me know what you think about the half day setting as well. And thank you again. Uh, we know it's the week after the 4th of July. I was afraid we wouldn't have good turnout, but we did. We had a great audience. Thanks for your question and your continued support.